Do you have neck pain? Can you trigger it by flexing, extending, or turning your head side to side? Maybe it gets triggered when you extend your arm like this or rotate your shoulder. Neck pain can be really overwhelming and scary. Maybe you had whiplash, maybe you were lifting in the gym, or maybe like me, you just woke up one day and you had this excruciating neck pain. You're not sure what caused it, but you know it wants to go away and you're not sure what to do. If so, this video is for you. Hey, my name is Lucas. I'm a yoga teacher. I'm a teacher trainer. I tweaked my C7 nerve a few years ago. And from my own experience healing and from what I've learned from many of my students ever since, I have a group of corrective exercises and routines that will hopefully be helpful for you along your healing journey. In this video, we'll talk about the anatomy of your cervical spine. We'll talk about some of the common issues that come up very frequently. And lastly, we'll look at some of those strengths flexibility, and then traction, a really unique pose to get some traction on your spine to hopefully accelerate your healing process. Quick note here, when you get any kind of neck pain, it can be really, really scary. There's lots of parts of your body that can hurt, but for a number of reasons, neck pain, it feels like it's inescapable, it feels like it affects everything that you do because it's so hard not to turn your head. If you're in this situation now, please know that the vast, vast majority of neck pain, even the stuff that feels really bad, most of it clears up within four to eight weeks. That's not tomorrow, but that's not forever. So take a deep breath, relax. It's very, very likely that your healing journey will be short enough and quick enough that you'll be back on your feet very quickly. Quick disclaimer here, if you have dizziness, if you've lost control of your bladder, if you have tingling sensations down into your fingers, if you have been hit by a car, please go see a specialist. Unlike the lumbar spine, which often remains a mystery, meaning what happened, with cervical spinal issues, very often specialists can do tests, muscle tests and movement tests that can help you isolate where the problem originates. Once you know where the problem starts, it is definitely easier to heal it. So really go get a doctor's advice. Everything I'll share with you here is for educational purposes. Based on my experience and those of my students, I hope it's helpful. Here's my story. I tweaked my C7 nerve a couple years back. I was doing yoga, nothing extreme. It was probably a repetitive stress injury. And I had a really intense pain around my periscapular region. So basically around my right shoulder blade. And it radiated down into my tricep. And in chaturanga pose, I basically collapsed down onto my mat. My tricep literally just didn't work. I freaked out. I went to see a specialist. Like I mentioned, did some muscle tests. And I learned for the first time, I had no idea that it was actually related to my neck. I thought I'd pulled a muscle or something like that. I was able to get back on my feet within a couple of weeks, pretty much all the way back. And within four weeks, it was pretty much all the way gone. I'm fairly certain that the exercises that I'll share with you here today helped along that journey. So I'll be sharing those with you as well. Let's start off by looking at the anatomy of your cervical spine. There are seven cervical vertebrae. And just like other regions of the spine, we have vertebrae, intervertebral discs, it's wrapped in ligaments, there are tendons connecting muscles, and of course we have our troublesome nerve roots that poke out on either side. So when we have a neck injury, it might be the bones, it might be the intervertebral discs, it might be the ligaments, very likely it's the muscles. Unlike the other regions of the spine, our cervical spine, as you can see right here, the bones are thinner and smaller than the other regions. Just because they're thinner and smaller, don't assume that your neck is weak. Some people do have very weak and frail necks, but some people like wrestlers and boxers and race car drivers, their ears connect to their shoulders. They have big tree trunks for neck. So it is certainly possible to have a really, really strong neck. And we don't want to exaggerate, but we can strengthen the musculature and you can have a very, very strong neck. Let's first talk about the muscles of the neck because those are the most common source of neck pain. There are over 20 different muscles that connect the base of your skull down into your shoulder blades and your collarbone. So inevitably, we're going to overlook most of those. Those little muscles, the ones we'll ignore, they are very, very important. But let's just look at four of them today or four sets of muscles today. The first one, if you crinkle up your neck here like this, this is called your platysma muscle. It's a superficial muscle that runs actually connects to your skin. It's really an unusual muscle and runs down over your collarbone. It affects your facial expression and it's involved, of course, in flexion of your cervical spine as well. Underneath your platysma, on either side, you have your scalene muscles. There's three of them. Scalene means uneven because all three of them are different lengths. 
And they're involved, for example, if you bring your ear towards your shoulder, those muscles are contracting. They're a very common source of injury as well. Now, the one that gets a lot of press, both for good and bad, is your sternocleidomastoid. It's quite a mouthful, but if you turn your head to the side and you reach behind your ear, you kind of look down towards your shoulder, very often you can feel this muscle here. It's almost like a snake-like muscle that wraps from here down to your clavicle and your sternum, sternocleidomastoid. This muscle is involved in turning your head to the side. It's also involved in ear to shoulder as well. And it's one of these muscles that when we're doing overhead movements and you turn your head, very often gets tweaked. The last muscle, and probably the most common offender when it comes to neck pain, is actually your trapezius muscles, your upper back muscles. Your traps are involved in elevation of your shoulder blades. And the challenge is when we get stressed, whether that's from a hard workout or even more likely from a hard day at the office, you get a phone call, <clears throat> you get stressed from your partner, <clears throat> you get worried about finances. Very often we hold mental and emotional stress in our trapezius muscles. And you don't need some weird yoga guy like me to tell you this. Just go to the grocery store, find the most stressed out person you can see, and you'll see right away their shoulders are up near their ears. What this means is excessive muscle tone, muscle tension, maybe even contracture over time can turn into, can manifest as neck pain. Could be the muscle itself, it can also impinge upon a nerve and create even more problems. Just a quick note here, of all the muscles in the body, your trapezius responds very, very well to push and release therapy, which is a fancy word for get somebody to stick their elbow into your trapezius, count one, two, three, four, five, release your elbow, five, four, three, two, one. You can do that with a massage ball, a foam roller, whatever it might be. So again, when, when we look at injuries, probably the most common are some type of muscle injury, just like your hamstrings, just like your quads, just like any other muscle in your body. They can be overstretched, they can be overtrained, so, so damaged, and they can, of course, be strained as well, which can create localized inflammation, and it could potentially impinge upon a nerve as well. When we start to take a look at more structural injuries to the neck, probably disc injuries, just like the lumbar spine, come up first on the list. Just like in our lumbar spine, how we have bulging discs and herniations, here in our cervical spine, we also will have disc bulges and disc herniations, and they very often happen down at C5, C6, C7, at those junctures. It has to do with geography more than anything because this region is the base of your cervical spine. The base is where the most weight, most pressure, most leverage, and least amount of mobility is. That's often where the bulge or the herniation happens. Most bulges or herniation will happen posteriorly, meaning if a disc were to push out, it will usually happen towards the back. And if that disc or that bulge or that herniation impinges upon a nerve, that's where we might start to get radiculopathy, this radiating pain that might go to your shoulder, your arm, or down even into your hands and your fingers. When we think about our neck, and we think about a herniated disc, at least for me, you get really freaked out. You start to think of it as a prescription for pain for the rest of your life, but that's not true. Remember, your body has amazing healing capacities, even for a severely herniated cervical disc, your body will send in cytokines, your body will send in macrophages, your body can in many cases clean up and remove over a number of weeks that bulging impinging tissue and the pain can and very often will go away. So even if you've been diagnosed with a bulging or herniated cervical spinal disc, please don't freak out. There's a very good chance that you can heal. The final issues there, of course, are many, many issues, but the final issues that come up are often issues of age, overuse, and degradation. Let's face it, as we get older, our body gets older as well, and we're trying to do our best to make use of these parts for as long as possible. The analogy I often use is like hiking boots. If you have a favorite pair of hiking boots from 10 years ago, 12 years ago, if you take really good care of them, they might get more and more years out of them. They don't look amazing, but they're still working. This is how our spine is over time. The issues that happen with degradation are often referred to as osteoarthritis, wear and tear arthritis, which is sometimes referred to as spondylosis. And again, this is really just 
degradation of your intervertebral discs, bone spurs, any kind of, again, let's come back to the hiking boot analogy. You got these old pair of hiking boots and they're working, but you flip them over and they've got some worn down areas, some uneven patches, maybe a little bit of scrape. Same sort of thing happens with our cervical spine. So when we have these degradation issues, whether it's discs or bone spurs, we tend to get compression, which tends to get pain, which tends to refer to nerves. The next issue, which again is usually related to age and overuse, is called stenosis. And stenosis is a narrowing of the holes, the foramen, where the nerves pass through, either the spinal cord or those nerve roots. And again, that can impinge upon the nerve. The last issue, well, there's still more issues, but facet joint syndrome, which are these joints along the backside of your cervical spine vertebrae here can get inflamed. Okay, great, Lucas. So we've got muscle problems. We've got structural problems. My spine's getting old. I've got bulging discs. What do we do? Well, no matter what your diagnosis, and please do get a proper diagnosis, no matter what you figure out is going on, the path forward is usually pretty similar. What we'd like to think about, whether we're thinking about a injured muscle, whether we are thinking about a compressed disc, whether we're thinking about a, a root, a, a one of your nerve roots that's being impinged upon, we really want to work on stabilizing your neck. That's the first leg of the stool, meaning strengthening the muscles that support it. Next, we want to look at flexibility. Am I able to actually articulate my neck properly? Because if I don't, I'll very often put pressure in one area of the, of the cervical spine that's uneven. And lastly, we'll take a look at a practice you might not have seen before, which is called traction. Many people do this with weird devices that pull their head apart. These are cool, but I'll show you a very different practice, which I think you'll find really, really valuable. Before we jump into these exercises, just one caveat here. I'm assuming that your injury is relatively recent. I'm assuming that your injury is pretty intense. And so all the exercises I will share with you are very, very mild and gentle. You will absolutely graduate and need to scale these up. These are gentle by design. Please be careful. And again, please check with your doctor. Let's take a look at the poses. Our first pose is for strength. This is called isometric neck press. It is gentle by design. I'm assuming you have pain. We will take a very conservative approach. You place your fingers outside your ear and press into the side of your head. Resist that press with a five out of 10 intensity. We'll do a 30 second hold to various sides. Let me show you how it works. 30 second timer. Take your right hand, press your fingers into the side of your head and resist with a five out of 10 intensity. Isometric holds allow us to very, very carefully with control, safely build strength in our neck. Don't get overly ambitious. Don't move fast. Remember we're in a healing phase. We want to be extra cautious with everything we do. Great, let's reset our timer and we'll switch sides. Again, if you feel any pain at all, back off with the intensity, modify the pose as you need to. Left side, press into your fingertips. Five out of 10 intensity, I'm using the muscles of my neck to brace against the push of my fingertips into the side of my head. Breath is in and out gently through your nose. Good, reset here. For the next pose, I'll place my hands in front of my forehead. Again, 30 seconds, interlace your hands and press with five out of 10 intensity. Great, and the final pose, you probably guessed it, you use sit-up style hands. So interlace your hands behind your head, press into your hands gently, five out of 10 intensity, resist the press of your hands to very gently engage the muscles that support your neck.
release your hands and shake it out. You can do this multiple times throughout the day. It's very gentle, but start off with 30 seconds to each of the four sides. Next, let's work on mobilizing, working on the flexibility of the muscles that support our cervical spine. These are neck rolls, but we'll do them in a very unique way. There's lots of great neck stretches, but almost everyone does them with their shoulders depressed, which is great, but in the real life, our shoulders are elevated, they're moving around, it's a lot more dynamic. We'll attempt to replicate that during this simple stretching exercise. Start off by flexing your neck, chin drops towards your chest, now elevate your shoulders, that means shrug. Depress your shoulders, that means unshrug. Protract your shoulders, so spread your shoulder blades apart. Retract your shoulders, so squeeze your shoulder blades together. Good, now release. That was flexion. Now extension, before we go back, take your tongue and press it into the roof of your hard palate, just behind your teeth. Drop your head back as far as you feel comfortable. Press your tongue. That'll give you a little bit of support here. Now shrug your shoulders up near your ears. Drop your shoulders away from your ears. Protract your shoulder blades. So spreading them apart. And now retract your shoulder blades, squeezing them together. Good. Return to center and release. Next, ear to shoulder, right ear to right shoulder, tilt your head. Elevate your shoulders up towards your ears. Depress your shoulders away from your ears. Protract your shoulders, spreading your scapula apart. Now retract your shoulders, squeezing your scapula together. Return back to center, release, switch sides. Left ear to your shoulder, as far as you feel comfortable. Now elevate your shoulders, depress your shoulders, unshrug. Protract your shoulder blades, so spread them apart. Retract your shoulder blades and release and back to center. From here, let's try eyes towards your right big toe. Pause here, shoulders up, shoulders down. Protract, retract eyes towards your left big toe down on the ground. Elevate your shoulders, depress your shoulders, protract and retract. Good, return to center, pause here. Imagine there's a bird up in the sky, turn your chin to look up, pause here. Elevate, depress, protract, retract, return to center. One last time, there's a bird up in the sky, this time to your left. Elevate, depress, protract, retract, release, and shake it out. If any one or multiple of those movements triggered pain, make note of it. The more you can understand about your pain condition, the better you can work with it. Pose number three will move over to the wall and you need a couple of chairs or a couple of stools. Last pose we'll do today is a traction pose. This is a supported shoulder stand. We'll do it at the wall two stools or two chairs. If you have kitchen chairs with a back, just tip them to the side so the back goes up. Make sure you have plenty of padding here. Very important, you're either on a carpeted surface or a sticky mat so your chairs don't slide around. I've got about three fists distance between my stools. You figure out what is right for you. Even if you've never gone upside down before, I know this pose looks really intimidating, but almost everyone can do it. However, it's really helpful if you have a spot or a partner to lift your legs up to the wall. We're doing spinal traction here, specifically cervical spinal traction. With our shoulders on the stools, my head and neck will hang loose and relaxed. We'll create just a teeny tiny bit of extra space between those intervertebral discs. For many people, it can give a very immediate relief from impingement pain. Let me show you how it works. I'll place my shoulders on the stools. I'll lift my hips up to the wall. Now the trick is to relax your head and neck. Allow the crown of your head to move down towards the floor. Keep your breath in and out through your nose. We'll hold here initially for 20 seconds. And eventually, as you get more and more comfortable, you'll work up to a one or even a two minute hold here. 
Good. As you come down, you'll feel a little bit of redness in your face. So if you relax in a child's pose, you can give yourself a break. Good, and slowly make your way back up. It's normal to feel a little bit of redness and heat in your head. Remember, please don't go upside down if you're suffering from high blood pressure, heart disease, glaucoma, or if you're pregnant. If in doubt, of course, check with your doctor. This pose is one of the best ways to get cervical spine traction. I hope you found this video helpful. Remember when you're working on healing your spine, think about strength, think about flexibility, and then experiment with traction. It can make a big, big difference in the short term for relieving pain. Remember to grab the PDF down below. I have a recap of the poses we just covered. If you'd like more science-based yoga videos, please click subscribe down below. I try to answer all my questions in the comments down below. If you have suggestions for future videos, I'd love to hear from you. My teaching calendar is at yogabody.com. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one.